Well, welcome back. It is time for the final panel of the, of the uh, conference. I know you're all looking forward to Sex and Space. It's uh, something we've all been anticipating. Uh, if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I want to spend a little bit of time. I want to take a moment to just recognize how much it's taken and how many people have contributed to making this conference work and getting us where we are. In the folders that you guys received, I, t I take some time to thank all of the people with the foundation, you know, the conference team, and those are the people who have been working in advance way up to the conference to make everything, to make everything come together. What I wanted to take a moment to do right now is there have been a number of volunteers who you've all seen around who have been doing so much work to make this come together. I mean, you know, all of us have been going out and enjoying the fact that but when you go out till four in the morning and then get up at seven in the morning to make this conference work, I mean, that's something we all need to appreciate, that it, it takes a lot. Um, so let me tell you, I want to take just a minute here to tell you about some of the people who have been, uh, who have been helping us. Um, first off the top, one of the people who's been doing, uh, running our slides, helping us with the AV, and doing a, an interminable number of uh, random tasks uh, Evan Speckhardt, who's right down here in the, in the front. For anyone who's interested, Evan's been interested in space for 20 years. He has a good bit of uh, experience in management and technical sales, other things like that, and he's looking to get involved with one of these companies. So if uh, anybody's looking for someone, you know, give Evan a call. Another person who helped us arrange the Bigelow tour, who uh, helped me basically get together some of the Issues for the banquet, who's been running around doing, again, doing some of the slides and presentations, who chased down all the speakers' bios, who's just been doing a ton of work, was Will Watson. I don't think Will's uh, here right now, but uh, for any of you who don't know, Will's also looking to uh, get in involved with a new company. He's got experience with T-Space, he's an ISU grad, he's proficient in Russian, he spent time with Rus in Russia. If anybody's looking, this is a guy you want to be talking to. Along the same lines, I'm sure all of you have noticed the uh, three women who have been working their butts off for this conference. This is actually the third space conference I've worked with uh, these three volunteers on, and so far as leadership and the foundation goes, I'd keep an eye on all three of them. But to talk about them as individuals, which is really the, the way we need to focus here. Um, <laughs> uh, Amanda Harris, who you guys probably know, she actually uh, helped organize the Sex and Space panel, as has got some other stuff together for the conference. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, she's actually graduating in uh, 2006 from uh, University of Michigan with an MBA, um, focusing on business development. This is so, this is some again. If you're if you're hiring or you're looking to hire, this is somebody else who's you know definitely uh, available that way. Um, some of you might have noticed uh, if you've been to the registration table, if you've if you if you've been at this conference, if you've been how much stuff we've been trying to get together, you might recognize Megan Seals. She's currently completing a master's degree in uh, elementary education at James Madison. Um, all three of these, uh, of, the, of the women I'm talking about right now, um, are what we call NASA Develops Scholars. And these are basically people who are working with NASA to use GIS information to help local business, local community. These are people who are taking space stuff and applying it to down-to-earth things. I've got, um, let's see, and you've also, I'm sure some of you have also noticed all the hard work that uh, the, the final person here that I want to talk about, uh, that Starla Kaiser has been doing. Starla is going to be introducing this next panel. I'll bring her up in a moment. But she's studied all over the place. She studied in Russia, the Netherlands, and is currently at Harvard Medical School pursuing a degree. This is someone, I mean, if, if you think about how much things these volunteers are doing, in their own time and that they're taking time out to make this conference work, I mean, I think we all owe them a ton of thanks. The last two people I'd like to take just a moment to thank, we have two uh, students who have been here who have been helping us again with the slides, registration, other places. Um, B. Thakur from uh, ISU and the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, uh, she's also involved with space generation. If anyone's looking for a uh, European citizen, be an astronaut or a test pilot, 
you need to call, talk to B. That's what she's after. <laughs> And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Ryan Kobrick, who uh, is at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He's a PhD grad student working on spacesuit technology. He's also with the XPRIZE Foundation. And, you know, if anyone needs consulting or wants to send anyone to space, you should also give him a call. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of those people. So if we can just give them a round of applause, please. And with that, I, th I think this is what we've all been waiting for. It's definitely what we're all gathered in the room for. I'd like to in introduce Starla Kaiser, who's going to uh, introduce the Sex and Space panel. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. So in my opinion, that was one of the best breaks ever, chocolate ice cream. And it goes perfectly with this panel that we've all been waiting for. Um, although we do like to have fun with this panel, there are definitely some serious aspects to the topic of sex and space that hopefully will be discussed today. And I have the great pleasure to introduce the three wonderful speakers to my right. First of all, um, there is Ms. Bonna Bonta. She is a sort of uh, renaissance woman, a poet, an artist, an author. She's the author of Flight, a quantum fiction novel, four poetry collections, assorted works, and essays. Her writing jobs include scripts for stars like Pierce Brosnan, and one of her stories was purchased by Paramount for Star Trek. Bonda's poetry has also been awarded two prestigious medals by literary committees in Florence, Italy. Next, we'll have Dr. James Logan. Dr. Jim Logan is a 17-year veteran of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, I could have said. <laughs> she is board certified in aerospace medicine and has held numerous positions at NASA, including Chief of Flight Medicine, Chief of Medical Operations, Chief of Medical Informatics and Healthcare Systems, and Life Science Liaison to the Space Station Program Office. He is also a founding member of the American Telemedicine Association. And our final speaker will be Ms. Laura Woodmansey. Laura is a science journalist, entrepreneur, and volunteer social solar system ambassador. She is a member of the National Association of Science Writers and is the author of um, women astronauts and also women of space cool careers on the final frontier and you can purchase these and she's also written sex in space which will be out in August and we're all looking very forward to that so now I would like to turn it over to Miss Bonna Bonta thank you hi it's a pleasure to be here I like Thank you, and a congratulations to Laura Woodmancy um, for her book coming out, Sex and Space, and presenter with a Fisher Space Pen. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank everybody here, and the pen is being one of the most powerful tools that we have to create the future. And it into being. Um, sex is also one of those tools because one of its byproducts is people. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> these are the uh, very exciting times. Uh, congratulations to Robert Bigelow, who is turning the ultimate um, make love not war into the ultimate metaphor by using silos that were used to launch warheads by launching hotels or prototypes where people will probably be recreating and having sex in space. So um, what everybody wants to know what are people having sex in space now? Um, pretty much, though a lot of them aren't talking, what happens in space does not stay in space. <laughs> because uh, right now, at any rate, people are very uh, uh, closely monitored. Um, but anyway, let's let's get going with this slide uh, thing. Sex and space. Okay. Sex and space. It's not just a good idea. It's survival. <laughs> there are many compelling reasons for human space settlement, um, for the survival of the human civilization 
humanity from natural and man-made disasters, and to fulfill the innate human drive of exploration and discovery. Um, besides settlement, uh, there will also be centers that can be, uh, we're heading out in other words, whether it's uh, extrasolar planets, Uh, backward, please. Back, please. Okay. The concept of left and right brain um, is a good one, but essentially there's a symbiosis. We need whole brains uh, um, to proceed. And science is essentially structure, and poetry comes from the root word poin, which is the Greek, uh, etymologically, the Greek word uh, root of creation. And sex does not take rocket science, or does it? Life is essentially the elements of creation and structure, but even poetry is engineered. The elements of poetry primarily are creation, inspiration, perception, and beauty. I don't think anybody would argue, however, that Bert Rutan is one of the greatest poets alive today. Um, whatever the medium, whether it's literature, whether it's science, whether it's, uh, it's, it's engineered, whether it's words, colors, uh, electronics, um, and in every element of the universe, we find rhythm and harmony, um, consinity, which in poetry is efficiency, um, the use of you know, distilling something down to its most basic word or phoneme, um, language and technique. And there, this constant symbiosis between engineering and poetry is going on. Uh, engineering is the mechanic structure and operation, but it's purpose purposeless without a function. And there are many purposes, but throughout them, what the hu what's particular to the human is the seeking of beauty in its many forms. With poetry, uh, the elements of beauty, love, pleasure, and romance are also aspects of sex that go beyond function but it also does not survive without engineering. Um, if one uh, doesn't know um, their meter, their words, etc. So sex and space is essentially the ultimate of poetry and science. Um, and the reasons uh, love, sex is about love, it's about fun, it's about companionship, it's about recreation, and it's about progeny. And uh, all the three elements are involved in ensuring that that continues, environments, biology, and survival. The poetry of sex in space. Just from the sheer aesthetic, there is a lot of poetry in the thought of weightlessness and new worlds and the beauty of our planet, the beauty of our solar system, the beauty of our cosmos and the beauty, the beauty of sharing that with another human being. It increases perception. The astronaut's view leads to a sense of that surpasses the myopia that we see in most news every day. Another benefit is you can get great hair. <laughs> so with aesthetics, there is just the pure aesthetic of weightlessness. But don't accept substitute. This is an earth imitation. <laughs> A cheap replication of zero G. OK, the science of sex in space. Let's get purely physical sex in new environments. OK. So there are conditions of varying gravity. Mars is a third. Moon is a sixth. Uh, in zero, in zero G, um, the, the redistribution of body fluids causes extra blood to pool around the heart. Um, it also creates the false sensation that um, the body contains too much liquid, so it depresses the sense of thirst, and it can lead to dehydration unless you force yourself to drink. Sweat flows more freely in the dried uh, space station air, so a lover could become further dehydrated if um, they keep at it too long without a break. Uh, the astronauts aren't talking about it, but zero gravity could possibly cause a slight decrease in the size of the erect penis due to the heart not working as hard or as fast and lower blood pressure. 
again, there are the, the plus side of uh, being capable of doing amazing feats effortlessly. And here the imagination um, is the only limit. So the nervous system speeds up in weightlessness, um, probably due to it being a new environment, so it's increased alertness. And sex in space is hotter and wetter than on Earth. During sex, body warmed moistened air will tend to hang close to the skin in zero gravity. The body heat doesn't rise, but it lingers suffocatingly. And couples coupling in mid-room will spew particles, ah, speaking of spewing, particles of various fluids into the air, which will stick to walls, viewports, TV screens, telephones, and the participants themselves. But love will find a way. Long-term missions to Mars will also um, involve screening clues for compatibility and a difference in sex drive as well as the effects of fertility and pregnancy will be factors that are considered in the crew. So from physics to poetry, the beauty and function. This is a scenario of, of uh, moon gravity. And your perception is 360 degrees. There's really no forward, backward. This, the implications of this, of, of creatures that actually would be born into a zero-G environment are really interesting. Um, also the fact that legs weaken and, and the theories that you would not be able to return to Earth. But Dr. Logan will get more into the specifics of the biology. And uh, another way astronauts play, um, way water behaves in zero gravity. So the idea of foreplay, since a jacuzzi would not be as we know it, might be a hydro room with orbits of water in a contained space. Uh, these are fluid orbs. Actually, the one on the right is um, carbonated water, so there's orbs within orbs. So one idea might be a molecular jacuzzi um, with variable programs of water size, like you could have fine mist, small orbs, to large orbs that could pulsate at different temperatures, different fragrances, different speeds, and you would be in zero gravity with Earth uh, below you and enjoying um, being bombarded with recyclable water. And that would also take care of your own body fluids. Okay. Uh, the most important thing if, of uh, accomplishing sex in zero G is stabilization. So, room with uh, handles and cubicles like that you can slip into. You can have the option of tying or securing yourself to a wall, and uh, a standard would be Velcro and uh, bungee cord type of thing. Um, there's space adaptation syndrome. I had the pleasure of uh, flying in zero gravity, but uh, one advice is to save the acrobatics for post-play and not foreplay. Although, um, space adaptation syndrome is not as I would have expected it when you hear about the Von Comet. Um, it's more like regurgitation as opposed to uh, peristolic motion because you really, you don't need a lot of peristolic motion um, to expel what you need to into your six sac. So it, it's not really that unpleasant. But if you're on a date, you definitely need to have the mouthwash with you. Um, if that's, uh, and don't get too wild in the beginning until afterwards. Uh, it's amazing the lack of attraction in um, zero gravity. I have had, a, well, according to Clinton, I don't know if it would be called sex, but I kissed in zero gravity. And <laughs> there was actually a sheer uh, lack of, of attraction between the mass of bodies, and it's quite, it was very surprising. You have to actually struggle to connect and keep connected. There's no help whatsoever to do so. Um, so some solutions when, when your masses aren't magnetizing, but you work together, would be the two suit. Um, and this is a suit that the unbuttons from the, well, it's not a button actually, it's like a, either a Velcro or a nylon zipper and you can connect at the top, uh, right there. You can, these portions here connect with the other. These are zippers that unzip and inside a diaphanous, very lightweight fabric balloons out, much 
expandable uh, knapsack or suitcase. So you're enclosed with your mate, um, which also probably emotionally would provide um, the sense of cuddling or being in close physical contact, which humans need in that kind of an environment. Like if you just want to chill and float and not have to struggle to be together, the two suit would be a way of, of accomplishing that. And of course you could get them in various fabrics, whether you're in um, vinyl or silk or brocade or rubber. And of course you always want to have sensible underwear. and. Um, and again, those underwear would be attachable to, um, to wall spaces. Um, Velcro mitts would be another way of stabilization. Of, again, fire-resistant uh, fire uh, fabric. And getting to the function of the aesthetic and purpose, not that the other is the lower purpose, and that is the future. People have been having sex in space for thousands of years. They just aren't really aware that they've been doing so or have a perspective that our gravity is just what we've been born into and are used to. The purpose and function of the continuum is up for discussion. However, with the human being, I think fundamentally our dreams, our ability to and the power to create them is what distinguishes us from other creatures and life forms, at least, that we are aware of at this time. Um, it's what all of our icons and our greatest heroes uh, epitomize, from Leonardo da Vinci and to the creative minds working um, within space and the movement today, um, in my opinion, are on the forefront of what mankind is, cap is capable of accomplishing. Um, it, flight and human flight is the icon of, of what human possibility is and all the best that we embody. So exploration and sex in space has, has upsides. Some of them we know. And some are yet unknown. Human reproduction in the absence of earthly gravity. Uh, initial study findings suggest in vitro fertilization is not dependent upon gravity. Um, Dr. Kojima said we believe, uh, concluded that we believe that gravity is not required for fertilization, although they, they did uh, note that there was some um, problem with um, embryonic uh, survival, embryo survival. The most important thing that we can explore um, for the future of our species is sex in space. Um, whether planned or not, it's eventually going to and our consciousness and our ability to be aware of it and to ponder the universe in which we live is the most extraordinary quality of the human being. That's, we will also be replicating consciousness, although uh, it's not always present when people have sex. The ability, uh, our birthright is that we are the children of a cosmos that evidences beauty, harmony, rhythm, rhyme, and perfect structure um, throughout it. Um, and in that spirit, may the continuum be unbroken. With those who, all who have loved before us, that brought us to this point in time, and all those who will come after us, unless of course the cure for death is accomplished within our lifetimes, may the continuum be unbroken, and uh, may we fathom the best capable of doing. Thank you very much for listening and having me here. Good morning. Well, this is obviously the hardcore. Right? And I'm honored to be a part of the hardcore panel. Um, my mother, I'm sure, will be very pleased when she hears about it. Um, I was thinking of maybe a different name for my presentation. I didn't want it to be scientific. I didn't want it to be dry. And so what I decided on is that the title of this presentation is Beyond the Thrill, What's the Big Deal? You have to say that a little bit with a Texas
because it just doesn't quite rhyme. Uh, I'm Dr. Jim Logan. I'm, I work at NASA, but I've got to give some disclaimers. Obviously, I'm not here representing the agency, and it's important for everybody in the, in the audience to realize that. Uh, I came to the, con to the conference on my own dime. I took leave time to do it, and I'm glad I did. It's the first uh, Space Frontier Foundation conference I've attended. I've enjoyed it very much. I've learned a lot. Uh, and I'm glad that finally today we're showing the human element. Uh, we may be last, but I will assure you that we are not least. NASA, and I think in many ways most private space organizations, are organizations of engineers, by engineers, and for engineers. And when you think about it, uh, that might be appropriate at this point in time, but definitely not um, eventually. Now, the aesthetic aspects of sex and space is really all a matter of speculation, because as far as I know, we have no real data. And so in that sense, it's kind of a projective test. It's uh, an ink blot, more or less. However, the biological sequela of sex and space, or more specifically, what comes afterwards has profound biological implications. Now, I'd like to take a poll here. How many of you have actually experienced zero-G? How many of you have flown in, the, in, the, in a zero-G aircraft? Okay, good, that's excellent. How many people have experienced lunar-G, one-sixth-G? Okay, how many people have experienced Mars-G, one-third-G? Okay, good. I've experienced a lot of zero-G in the NASA uh, vomit comet, and I've also experienced some lunar G and Mars G in that vehicle as well. And my own personal observation is that sex in micro G might be a little underwhelming, and that is that the fantasy might be vastly superior to the reality uh, because it's a pretty messy environment uh, when you think about it, and for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. However, Having, having experienced zero-G, lunar-G, and Mars-G, I can well imagine how compelling, inspiring, and quite frankly stimulating choreographed sex in zero-G might be in the hands of a skilled and talented cinematographer with appropriate music and music. So, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Sex in, in zero-G is going to have to be more or less choreographed. So otherwise, it's just going to be a wild flail. Now, experience, experiments have been carried out in space using a variety of species, and I'm talking about developmental biology experiments. Uh, the species included uh, include rats, mice, non-human primates, fish, invertebrates, amphibians, and insects. I'm not going to bother you with all the physiologic changes that occur in, in zero G because that's a whole different different subject, and I'm sure most people in this audience are well aware of, of the uh, paradigm. But as you know, in zero-G, you basically de-adapt from a one-gravity environment, and you adapt to the zero-G uh, environment. Now, in order to try to prevent full adaptation, we come up with countermeasures. It's important to understand that the countermeasures are temporary in nature. Okay, we do that for a little while. And ultimately, the ultimate countermeasure is what? gravity. You come back to Earth. Okay? So that's important uh, to realize, and I will tell you categorically that the temporary countermeasures that we use per se are quite frankly not all that uh, effective. How many of you have ever heard of the critical path roadmap at NASA? People in this audience. Well, in the life sciences, we've had a critical path roadmap, which are the, the problems associated with spaceflight, uh, biological medical problems associated with spaceflight. And we've had this critical path roadmap for over 20 years. In the last 20 years, about $30 million a year has been spent in, in research, both ground-based and space-based, to address the problems on this critical path roadmap. However, there has not been a single problem on the critical path roadmap that is officially retired. That's after having spent over $600 million of your taxpayers' money. There isn't even a mechanism, a bureaucratic mechanism, for retiring a problem on the critical path roadmap. All right, enough of that. Back to sex. Magnetic resonance images, uh, imaging has shown the value of a specific fetal and amniotic fluid weights. And apparently, the weight of the fetus 
human fetus up to the 18th week of gestation has been determined. Now remember that a term human birth is somewhere around 36 weeks. Here's the thing to remember. Up to the 21st or 22nd gestational week, the fetus is in conditions very similar to neutral floating. Okay, so the fetus up to 21 weeks, it's like being in the neutral buoyancy lab down at Johnson Space Center, if you've ever visited that. However, after the 26th week, gestational week, the apparent weight of the fetus really is prominent compared to the amniotic fluid, and you've got a decreased effect of buoyant forces upon the fetus. And this has significant implications for the colonization of, of the solar system. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that during space, um, you cannot use the existing countermeasures for a fetus or, or an a, uh, embryo or even a child. Okay, so the whole idea of temporary countermeasures for that age group is basically a moot point. The absence of gravitational loading would cause all kinds of problems, and I won't go into them because I don't think time really permits us to do that, but you know most of them. I will tell you one experiment on one of the Russian biocosmos satellites involving pregnant rats showed that uh, the active formation of fetal bones involved a 13, 17 percent arrest in the development of nearly every area of the fetal skeleton. That's a significant issue. Because of the de decreased capacity of po postural and locomotor stability, uh, also, it's very obvious that the acquisition of what we call gross developmental milestones, such as sitting, standing, and walking, could definitely be delayed. And we know this because building adequate proper neural connections after birth requires movement under gravity. Okay, because when you're born, not all your connections are, are made. And those connections are made in the first few weeks, months, and years of life. And of course, that occurs in gravity. There are even cross-coupled effects. Immune function has been shown to be somewhat compromised after long duration exposure to a weightless environment. Now, in mice, you can mimic the same degree of changes in the immune system that happens in space. You can mimic that on Earth by just using hind limb suspension. Now, what does that mean? That means that gravity is very, very important. Now, I was an evolutionary biologist before I went to medical school. And here's the salient fact that I want you to take away from this. We evolved on Earth over the period of 3.8 billion years. And everything changed except for one thing. What was the one constant in 3.8 billion years? Gravity. In my opinion, and this is just an, an, an opinion, take it with a grain of salt, I know this will be heresy to some of you, but the prospect of doing a single jump from 3.8 billion years at one gravity into some kind of a weightless civilization is extremely naive, in my opinion. Now, there's no air out there, so what happens? we take our own air, right? Or we create it. There's no food out there, so we take our own food. No engineer in his right mind would advocate not taking air and not taking food. Likewise, there is no gravity out in space, so what's the answer? You take your gravity with you. You have to create your gravity. The question is this, this is year 45 of human space flight and we still do not have an inkling of what the gravity prescription is. Think of gravity as a medication. We don't know the dose, we don't know the frequency, and we don't know the side effects. Those of you who are looking at space, as a potential for human settlement, and I consider myself one of those, you had better lobby extensively to find out what the gravity prescription is. Because it all depends on whether we're talking uh, about space as a sortie destination or 
frontier destination. And the example I always use is Antarctica. Antarctica, despite, we've been exploring Antarctica for over 100 years, and despite modern technology, it's still a sortie destination. We have not humanized Antarctica, because it's a pretty hostile place to, to be in. In my opinion, when we think about the gravity prescription, it is very possible in my opinion, that one sixth G won't be enough. And if that's true, the moon is out as a frontier destination. Now, eventually we may have some magic pill. Eventually we may learn how to switch off and on certain chromosomes, granted. But in the short or intermediate range, if, if the bar is above 1 6 G, the moon is not a frontier destination. It may always be a destination for a number of valid reasons. The same argument can be made about Mars. It is possible that you may need much more than 1 3rd G. If that's true, Mars is out as a frontier destination. And by frontier destination, I'm talking about a destination in which there are multiple generations, men, women, and children. Now, that's a pretty profound driver. And so I urge all of you that are interested in the space community to do some thinking about how are we going to arrive at the gravity prescription. And it probably won't necessarily be one size fits all. The only thing that we know now is 1G, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, works. We know that the Apollo astronauts that spent time on the moon were a little less deconditioned than their counterparts that were overhead, but it was not statistically significant at all. It was very, very minor. My last point then, uh, well, before I make my last point, my second to the last point is if, if space, if it's too early to talk about space as a frontier destination, in other words, if we should only have, have in our viewpoint space as a sortie destination, that's fine. This is year 45 of manned space flight. If not now, when? Give me a number. By what year of human space flight should we determine whether some of these areas that we talk about all the time are really even options? for a frontier destination. And the last thing that I want to, the last point I want to make is in the long term, and I know this is going to be heresy to most of you because most of you love your rocket engines and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of that, but long term, the tall pole in the tent is life sciences. That's the tall pole in the tent. So every time you think about space as a frontier destination, quit using the word pioneering. It will not be pioneering, it will be bioneering. That's what mankind has always done. And as man expanded from Africa, if he couldn't bioneer, he didn't survive. And against those laws, there, are, there is no... So that's the message uh, I, I would like to leave you with. Thank you very much. Sorry? Okay, great. I'm short, so I have to adjust everything. Um, hi, my name is Laura Woodmansey. Um, I'm happy to be here today. I just uh, completed a book called Sex in Space, and uh, Apogee Books is here taking pre-orders for it in case you're interested. Um, the book comes out in uh, early to mid-August, we'll see, um, and covers uh, everything that you think it does and a whole lot more. Um, issues that Vana and Dr. Box are in this book, um, so I'm just going to go through some points, and uh, I hope that it'll be fun. Um, I should start by saying I am a science journalist. I'm not a scientist, but I have a deep interest in science and space and space exploration. Um, I am definitely one of those people who would love to go into space and see humanity go to the stars and settle the stars and do wonderful things. Um, let's see, I'm the author. 
Uh, women astronauts, women with space, cool careers on the final frontier, and my latest, Sex in Space. Um, let's see. A little bit, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the. Sorry. Um, that's my website, is uh, website links are up there. So if you're interested in finding out more about the book after, then uh, you can check that out. All right, uh, this is just a little bit about me. Um, I told you about my writing. Um, I'm starting a tea little t-shirt company, spacey t-shirts, things like that. Um, I'm also a volunteer solar system ambassador. That's a, a jet propulsion lab program. And I go and I speak to groups of people. I've talked to everyone from Girl Scouts to religious groups and everything in between. Um, latest book, you know. Um, what I should mention is that Rick Tumlinson wrote the foreword. And he wrote a beautiful foreword. And everyone should read it. I just love it. Um, let's see. Um, let's go into my next slide. Whoops, sorry. Why sex in space? Now this is a topic that makes everyone giggle when it, when it comes up. Um, basically, human beings are going to take their sexuality wherever they go, just as Vana said. It, that's how people reproduce, that's how we make more people. So it's not, it's not going to stop um, just because right now it seems very engineering oriented. We have to start thinking about the serious reality of it because I guarantee you as soon as people can go up into space and have honeymoons in orbit and uh, there are going to be people having sex in space. Let's just everybody admit it. So um, why did I write this book? Um, I wanted to make a point that, and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to get people thinking seriously about the topic, both about the fun part and the serious part. And before we get bogged serious stuff, there is a lot of fun stuff about it. So let's see. Um, I guess my perspective is I'm a mom. So my son is in the back making a little bit of noise, so excuse him. But uh, that's where I kind of see everything from is uh, I'm a mom. I want to protect my child or any children I have in the future. And I can't imagine sending him, them into you know, the world to do or, or doing something that would endanger them. So that's part of my concern about writing the book um, that caused me to write the book. So I wasn't really sure what I would find out when I started to, to write it. Um, so as you'll see in my PowerPoint, there's a little bit more to it. Um, but basically, in this age of space tourism, it's not going to be long before there's a couple up there who makes love in space and may conceive a child. So there are important things to consider. I'll go on to my next slide. Um, this is the first chapter in the book is called Has Anyone Done It in Space? and uh, covers the rumors and the reality and the evidence. Has anyone done it in space or not? Um, excuse me. Um, when we consider the topic of sex in space, um, we have to talk about the rumors. We have to talk about uh, the rumors of affairs between astronauts, Russian uh, cosmonauts, um, uh, American NASA astronauts. Um, there was a couple, uh, Mark Lee and Jan Davis, um, who went up on uh, the Endeavour space shuttle in 1992. There was a lot of controversy at the time about this. A lot of uh, press asked, "Are they going to have sex in space? Are they?" You know. And uh, Jan Davis, who spoke to me from my previous book, uh, Women Astronauts, declined to be uh, interviewed for this one. Uh, she still works for NASA. Her answer to me was, "No way." Thanks, <laughs> but no way. <laughs> um, and Mark Lee doesn't work for NASA anymore. So it may be that she still works for NASA, and that's why she doesn't want to talk. Um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, let's see, another topic. Another topic is pornography in space. Um, there are, <laughs> let's see. Um, there was an attempt to, uh, to film a, excuse me film a uh, pornography film, make a porno film, um, on the Mir Space Station, but that didn't really work out. But um, not that I'm into watching porno films, but I think that's a shame because imagine the number of people who would have bought that DVD and watched it and be become interested in space if they weren't before. So anyhow, um, as for the astronauts, those two astronauts there, I interviewed several people for the book. and. 
Rod Roddenberry, son of uh, Dean Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, had this to say, I guarantee you it happened, and I have no proof except common sense. <laughs> okay, the second of our natural questions that arise is, how would you make love in space? How would two people do it? Uh, second chapter covers this in, in detail. Um, lots of questions, lots of uh, things. It's explicit, it's not pornographic, but it's ex definitely explicit. Um, let's see, so-called docking maneuvers. I think everybody can figure out what that is. Um, let's see, obviously living in space is different from Earth, no gravity as we have been talking about. Um, gravity helps couples here more than they would probably admit. Um, in space, you would probably need some sort of restraints to take to stay together. Um, and then we have things to consider like uh, interior design, which I guess comes into the talk about restraints and how you, two people would stay together. Um, as we've heard, there, there's no convection in space. Uh, heat and cooling off would be a problem. You'd need fans to circulate the heat, et cetera. And you'd basically, you'd need a nice environment that you felt safe and you felt comfortable enough to you know, be with your significant other in, so serious issues. Um, I thought this was a great quote from Derek Shannon. It was here and I think left yesterday. Um, it's the initial awkwardness that is most likely to detract from the romance, so it will take practice to make perfect. So I thought that was really funny. So the couples that go up will have to practice a lot, so. Kind of amusing. All right, third topic is um, mu much more serious, uh, creating new life in space. So making space babies. Um, you've already heard is, uh, I won't go over the topics that he covered exactly, but um, like I said, I'm a mom. So the idea of uh, possibly creating a child in space and uh, anything negative happening to a child in space, whether you know, it was me or anybody else is, is extremely disturbing to me and really terrifying because there could be just horrible results. I, conception might be one thing, might, might be okay. I still would worry about radiation, um, but pregnancy definitely would be out of it. Pregnancy and delivery, I think, in, in space would, from everyone that I've talked to and everything that I've read and heard would just be disastrous and pretty awful. Um, the two, the two main issues, I'm sorry, go on to my next slide, there are the three main issues, but, um, the question is, uh, as you alluded to, uh, you know, drugs work differently in space than they do here on Earth. So, my question that I don't have an answer for, um, and I would like an answer for is, do oral contraceptives work in space? There are several women astronauts who take them, who take medicine, quote unquote, to suppress their, their menstrual cycles. Um, have there been blood tests taken? Do they, are they testing uh, to make sure that this is suppressing ovulation? There are, these are big questions that are serious questions if people are going to space for long periods of time. Um, not just space tourists, but space settlers. Um, let's see. Is conception even possible in space? We've seen from lots of experiments that it is in animals, so we assume that it is in humans. There might be some problems, but already heard a lot of this. Um, so gravity, gravity and radiation are the biggest, the biggest problems, I think, in the pregnancy, when you think about pregnancy in space. Uh, let's see. But as we go into space, we will become aliens. Our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will actually become aliens because they will be so different. They will adapt to space as much as we will try to prevent it with all these countermeasures and, and you know, lack of gravity, lack of 1G exactly is, is going to cause changes and radiation, radiation is very dangerous. So the, anyway, those are the two topics we really need to discuss. And on to the next one. Um, Millie Hughes Fulford is a former astronaut. Um, she runs the um, director of She's the director of the Lab of Cell Growth in San Francisco. Uh, she said, we know little about the role of gravity and fertilization in fetal development. It would be dangerous to conceive and carry out a pregnancy without normal Earth gravity. So that about sums it up. 
Okay. Um, next topic is uh, sex on the brain and lust in space. Made up this kind of silly slide here. Um, Mars needs love. Uh, NASA and the space agencies have basically have an archaic view about sex and sexuality and what people are going to do uh, when they get to space. Um, it, it seems to me from all my research that they view sex as a part of life, not part of life and the creation of life. <laughs> Bless you. Um, in the book, I discuss a lot about uh, what type of crew, what type of you know, what type of crew, how many men and how many women uh, would be perfect for a, a long journey, and what the the sexual issues and what the relationship issues would be like. Um, and that's that's a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, what might future culture be like? How is sex in space and the lack of gravity and all all of these issues? You know limited resources, how is that going to change, how is that going to change um, our society, our future space society? Might there be laws against reproduction in certain, in certain environments, in certain gravitational uh, areas? Le less gravity than Earth, I mean. Um, let's see. Oh, and I talk about sex at NASA. Um, the, Public, <laughs> public affairs officers at NASA really played dumb with me. Um, it was very, very frustrating. Uh, they had an answer for everything. Oh, we don't, you know, we don't know what you're talking about. Oh, we don't do that. Oh, we don't do this. Well, so a lot of evidence that I had to gather was from people who were willing to talk to me, you know, um, outside of NASA, uh, you know, saying this is, you know, this is my opinion. This isn't NASA saying this. Things like that. So, very interesting, the attitude. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm very interested to see the reaction to the book when it comes out. Um, let's see, final chapter. Oops, another quote. Uh, Cheryl Bishop is a space psychologist and she knows everything. Um, she says, if you, try, if you try to go through the agency, meaning NASA, you're never going to get past the front door. Nobody side is going to discuss sex in space. It's a deep cultural discomfort zone. And boy, is that true. Um, anyhow, just let that sit. Um, to infinity and beyond the future. There we go. All right. Basically, what I neglected to mention at the, at the beginning of my talk is that I believe that space is the killer app of or sex is the killer app of space tourism. And if you could, forgive me for using a 90s term, but it's just the best term to describe it. Because everybody, every couple who goes up there, or threesomes, or whatever their personal choice is, is going to want to try this. And they are going to have to get over the space adaptation sickness. And when they feel better, they will try it. I guarantee it. Um, so that's, that's my point on that. Uh, the heavenly bedroom. Um, that's just describing what what a bedroom in space, the ideal bedroom in space, would be like privacy and and all that, and looking at the stars and and um, go into detail about that in the book. Um, let's see. I guess I just want to make the point that our our children and our grandchildren, et cetera, will be space aliens. They will change. They will change how humans are. They will be different than us in some way. And maybe these aren't, if we really are going to go into space, these are adaptations, but they're going to be painful, I think, in any case, you know. Um, and it's disturbing, but it's something that we need to think about if we are truly going to be a space-faring civilization and settle the galaxy. Um, and I just have one final quote. John Spencer, President of Space Tourism Society. We want to create a luxurious environment. Our job as designers is to create these beautiful, sensual, safe environments to the whole lovemaking process. So he is working on beautiful hotels, um, beautiful hotels, and has a great book out about it, actually, Space Tourism, Do You Want to Go? Which Apogee Books, actually, publishes that one, too. And um, there we go. There's the book, there's the ISBN number if you're interested. It comes out in August. Um, Apogee Books, like I said, is taking uh, pre-orders for it if you're interested. Um, and they have an uh, author's photo. 
um, signed author's photo if you're interested. And uh, that's it. Anyway, um, thank you all for listening. <laughs>
different approach. It's, it was human. I mean, there, you, know, you can talk um, moral or ethics uh, all you want, but I think most definitely that the two need to be integrated because living is a human experiment, uh, ex experiment and experience. Um, and our humanity needs to be integrated with the, um, the engineering and, and the purpose behind the function is, is human and hopefully to serve and respect the, um, the greater uh, creation or cosmos of which we're a part. Um, I actually had a question that sort of um, tied in with that. May I ask it or did, did someone else have a? Okay, it was an ethical question. Um, within how many, I was very interested in the comment about the skeletal structure uh, initially uh, being the first to not develop. And you almost think of these, you know, 360 degree creatures, how they would form. Would they be gelatinous would they have appendages? Would they have many appendages? Would they have, at what point would it become an ethical question that someone could volunteer and say, I would like to conceive, or we see this is happening with animals, I would like to conceive, and I know this is how my baby is going to be born. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and it's a very complex answer. And within uh, how many generations? Well, well, first of all, it would be all speculation. We, we, we don't know the answer to the question, but in terms of informed consent, the dimension of the, uh, of the question, it would be okay to have informed consent for things that are going to happen to you. There are a lot of people that could argue that it is not ethical to sign off an informed consent for a citizen from the next generation. And so that's a, that's a, um, th I think that'll be a very thorny uh, issue. So I don't really, as from a medical standpoint, purely medical standpoint, since I'm a physician, uh, you know, if you're talking about 17% decrease in skeletal muscle mass of a fetus, mm -hmm. That crosses my line in terms of ethics, right, right. my own personal line. So I would not advocate that at all. Well, what is the, uh, you said that there's a danger in conception in zero G. Is that just the radiation effects of outer space or is there some actual uh, danger of, of zero G that's known or is it? Well, I'll take a cut at that medically. And uh, uh, there are two issues for conception. One is a medical issue. And that is uh, when we, I'm one of the physicians that support the crews in space. Um, now I'm gonna preface this statement by making another statement. And, and that is the, the initial statement I wanna make, so the second statement is not misinterpreted, is uh, men, let's face it, women are genetically superior to us. That's a fact, okay? <laughs> I need to make that as my initial statement because the next statement I'm going to make is when it comes to the differential diagnosis of belly pain, acute abdominal pain, the diagnosis is infinitely simpler in men than it is in women. Okay? So from a purely operational standpoint of, of doing medical care in space, which is part of what I do and 100% of, of what I did, the one condition you'd like to fill out initially is an ectopic pregnancy, okay? So that has a medical dimension. Now, a, a, a fetal dimension is definitely relates to radiation. I mean, look, there, there are two dirty little secrets of space flight. One is the lack of gravity, and the other is radiation. And they are probably synergistic, okay? The effects of both of them together are probably worse than the effects either of them alone. How many of you saw the recent study that was published that said that even as a result of one medical radiation treatment, that uh, trabecular bone decreased by as much as 30%? And that was here on Earth. Anybody see that, that uh, scientific publication recently? It was actually on NASA Watch, and it was released as well. So it, it may be that it looks as though radiation and hypogravity is a very bad combination. Let me do an, an analogy to radiation, because all, engineers all the time are accusing the life sciences people of screaming, the house is falling, the house is falling. Okay. Let me give you an analogy of radiation. Water is dangerous to human beings. Okay. When early man went across the continents and stopped at the shore, if they wanted to swim across a body of water, that body of water could kill them, right? I mean, you could drown. 
become hypothermic, whatever. It was dangerous. Water was dangerous. So what did they do? They developed technology to isolate themselves from the water. We call those boats. Earth shouldn't be called Earth. Earth should be called water. It's 75% water. Space should not be called space. Space should be called radiation. And so to go anywhere and to prosper, you know, to live long and prosper, we're going to have to come up with the technology that isolates us from the radiation, just like early man had to isolate himself from the water. So when you think of radiation, the analogy is to water. Radiation is to 21st century man what water was to cavemen. I don't know whether that analogy helps, but that's the way I like to, like to think about it. Any other comments? I mean, you want to um, take a cut at that? No, no comment on that. Um, yeah, go, go ahead and use the mic. An elaboration on it, what might be some solutions to um, boats, both um, for gravity, um, to replicate gravity, once the, and what would it take to, A, develop the gravity prescription and finally conclude that, more studies, B, um, could it be sort of an app, acclimation of progressive step that right now it might be ethically as a, as, a, as a medical professional, you know, when you're determining is it ethical to allow this birth to come to term, um, it may not be now, but let's say in a few hundred years from now, if it happens gradually, um, it, it might yeah, not be so. That's, a, that's an excellent question, and I've, and I've thought about that um, a lot, as you might imagine. Here's what I would do if I were running things, and, and by the way, to happen because I'm never going to be running things. Okay. What I would do is set up a variable G research facility in low earth orbit. And in my opinion, that should have been done 20 years ago. I mean, I, it, in a way, I wish we had the $100 billion for the shuttle and the $100 billion for the space station and the last 25 years. And if I had my way, I would have reprogrammed that into a variable G research facility right after Skylab back in the 70s. And the first gravity uh, level that I would do my, my studies in is one-third G. Why? Well, that's Martian G. If one-third G isn't enough, you already know one-sixth G isn't enough. In fact, in my opinion, what we're really being moved toward now, based on what we know and a little bit of knowing a little bit more about what we don't know, in my opinion, we, I think we need the concept of the O'Neill type colony that solves several problems for you. And by the way, I think living in a place that has variable G would be very exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and it would be beneficial medically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm 55 years old and trust me, one thing I've discovered recently in the last five or six years is gravity is not my friend. Okay? And those of you who have experienced Martian G, it's delightful. I mean, Mars is a terribly hostile place. But Mars gravity is outstanding. Yes. And so if I were going to live in an, in in an O'Neill colony, uh, those in my cohort and older, we want the real estate at one-third G. That's where we'll live. And we'll go down to the equator and do our exercise. Maybe do a little shopping, OK? And then it's back to Mars G to live. Because when I you know, fall down the steps or something, it's going to hurt a lot less at one-third G than it does at one G. So that, that's just a personal aside, but that, it's an excellent question. Actually, can I make a comment for a sec? Is this microphone on? Yeah. All right, great. Um, I just wanted to go back to the bioastronautics roadmap, roadmap for a second. I, I just wanted to note that one of the conclusions, one of the recommendations was that NASA needs to study human sexuality and how it might uh, be a problem, whatever that is, in long-term missions. So that's one thing that I want to note. Um, I like, I really like your idea of the O'Neill colonies and uh, my husband jokes, but he's not really joking about, uh, he wants to retire on the moon. I guess Mars would be better, but, um, so I think that's great and any business ideas out there for that. <laughs> that's all I want to say. <laughs> um, really interesting to uh, hear Dr. Logan take the analogy of water. I'd like to take that to a more prehistoric era. Um, I'd argue that our species has 
through variable gravity when we once were life forms that existed in, in water. Mm -hmm. And that transformation from simple organisms that lived in water to complex intelligent ones that developed on land under one gravity, that took a long time. And this is what we are trying to do by taking ourselves into, a, uh, an, into an environment of microgravity. Um, one thing I would like to ask you is how long, you put up the same question saying how long would it take for us to have a long term adaptation to microgravity into settlement and I think that's sort of a similar life, uh, sort of time scale that a life form has to take when, when we transmitted from, tra transacted from water to land. Um, but at that time, our physiology was significantly different. We had simpler hormones, or none at all, I don't know that. But could you talk about what sort of hormonal changes occur in long-term space flight and the effect of different drugs that are administered on astronauts? Well, I, I'm certainly not an expert on the hormonal changes of space flight. You'd have to ask some of the researchers for that. But I know that there are quite a few changes. I, I know, I definitely know, uh, from talking to astronauts in the studies that we've done, that the, that the pharmacology of micro G is vastly different than the pharmacology at, at, at 1G. And frankly, we don't even know how an antibiotic works in 0G. We don't even know anything about the absorption. We generalize based on what we've, what we've heard. For instance, in the early days, in the 80s, when we were first flying shuttle, we used scopolamine uh, uh, dexedrine, a scope dex pill. And you know, you'd work with the astronauts. They would take almost everything in the medical kit while they were on Earth to assess if there were any side effects, because we sure didn't want to interfere with their performance, you know, their performance capabilities in flight. And a lot of them took scope dex in orbit. And many times, I would have astronauts tell me, uh, Jim, you know, it's amazing. When I take a scope dex pill on the ground, I get my side effects, you know, dry mouth, whatever. I get that within 20 minutes. When I took the pill in space. I never got side effects. Now, what does, that, what does that imply? Well, to me, it implies that absorption may not be all that great, OK? Or you may absorb the over a much longer period of time. So there are a lot of pharmacokinetics that we really need to do uh, just to medically support the missions that we have now. And I think our present knowledge is woefully inadequate today, considering this is year 45 of human spaceflight. Now, let me kind of address also your issue of, and your point is very well taken about the transition from a, an aquatic, you know, life form to a, to a terrestrial life form. But remember, that did not happen all the jump. That happened very gradually. It happened over millions of years. It was aided by several mass extinctions. Uh, and so the point that I made was that it was naive to think that we were going to do a single jump from 3.8 billion years of 1G then to, you know, on, uh, on February 18th, 2023, uh, we make the jump into a weightless civilization. I, I don't see that. I realize that may go against some of the, some of the mythology that has, uh, that has evolved uh, through space settlement, but as a medical person, I don't see that. Uh, comment again. No, no please. No, go ahead. Uh, things always take longer. It's the, um, the uh, vision. It's not to say that it can't be done, but it's right. just whether. Uh, I thought that was an excellent point. Uh, we, we can't fathom where we, we uh, the metamorphosis of, of human consciousness. And it brings up an interesting question of you know, what is it to be human? We have a certain frame of reference of our recorded history and what we can speculate about plankton and the beginning, the soup. Um, but I don't think we should necessarily be limited to being open to wherever it goes, um, not to prevent that, uh, uh, not to expect that it's going to happen in 20 years. But um, I think that when many of the greatest things that human beings have accomplished uh, the end was not in sight, in fact, most of them. Uh, when Leonardo watched birds in the uh, marketplace and drew their wings, did he, he probably envisioned that we would be on the moon. 
maybe the side of a rocket would have blown him away. He couldn't have fathomed that. I don't know. So it's. Yeah. I think the only thing you can truly say, and I think this is a very safe statement, is if you can't figure out how to bio near, bio near with a B, you're not going anywhere. And it, it's important that that's acknowledged and perceived because the structure will not be attained. The vision will not be attained without the structure. And the structure has to be addressed with specifics, with the math, with what's in front of you. And I think um, advocating for um, the variable um, G research facilities and for binary and to find the gravity prescription are top of the list in terms of moving, moving it forward. Right, and also I'll go back to a statement that Howard made uh, last session, which I thought was excellent, and I'm sure, Howard, you probably agree with this statement. If we can't figure out how to bio near today, here, in the environment that we have, we're not going to survive either. Okay. Oh, I, I just had a, a quick uh, couple of questions. Uh, one is, it's hard to believe that there hasn't been at least studies into the hormonal effects of spaceflight in animals. No, there, there, there have been. I'm just, I'm just, I don't consider myself an expert in them. Mm -hmm. I, I can't give you the specifics. But uh, those would perhaps give some insights into uh, the sorts of responses that you're talking about, maybe in weightlessness. Uh, and then also, it's hard to believe that uh, people going up to the space station don't, don't get at least some common sense advice on you know, these sorts of issues. Oh, they, get a, they get a lot of common sense advice. Uh-huh. And it's the sort of advice that you'd kind of expect uh, telling someone who's going on a long-term trip about, you know, sexuality and, and kind of how to take care of yourself? I'm not sure I totally understand your question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying... I, I think I do. Yeah, okay. But um, I think, I, think I, I would guess that most people in our society are probably already aware of how to take care of yourself mm -hmm. in an isolated circumstance. So uh, I haven't had anybody personally come to me and ask me for advice, if, if, <laughs> if that's your question. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but on the other hand, I'm sure that they have some working knowledge of the area. And there's no special, nothing special they need to keep in mind. There's no sign like uh, in restaurants, if you're pregnant, the red wine may be harmful. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good no question, posting. though. And, yeah. and I was just going to note that I think that there's a group at MIT that's trying to work on a variable G experiment with mice that started mm -hmm. out with Zubrin, and I think they're picking it up. So mm -hmm. perhaps that'll And, and also realize, look, uh, artificial gravity is not, that's not trivial either. There are huge problems with artificial gravity, huge problems. And, it, and if anything, artificial gravity, one of the good things gravity is because of the of the physiologic implications of artificial G it's going to drive you to large space structures that's good isn't it yeah um, I do I do have another important and boring question but first let me uh, wake up the crowd a little bit and point out since my wife is not here I can say this about retribution that given the innumerable mission simulations that astronauts and cosmonauts uh, the technical issue of leverage can be explored in simulators like swimming pools and things like that. So feel free to experiment. Um, but back to the, the issue that we're talking about here, which is importance for the long-term movement of humanity out into space. Engineering-wise, we know how to build vehicles. Uh, I mean, I, as an engineer, I can tell you it is merely engineering to get up to orbit. Mm -hmm. Not that that's not hard, but there's no new physics involved, none of that. After four it seems to me that not only don't we have answers to, to critical questions here, but nobody is even doing the research. Now, given what you said, that NASA doesn't do frontiers, NASA does vehicles, where is the right place for this kind of critical research to decide whether or not we can ever be a spacefaring civilization or not? It's an excellent question, uh, and I think you've got a, no pun intended, you've got a vacuum in that area. Uh, uh, it, it just empirically is not doing that. And there, you know, there are reasons that I think could be interpreted as valid for why they're not doing it. Uh, I personally wish they were doing it, but they're not. And they have their valid reasons for, for not doing that. So that puts it up in the air. So uh, whoever is interested can do that. And, and by saying that, I want to make a kind of a commercial to this group. And that is, since this group is motivated the way it is, life sciences is a 
this whole thing. And so I encourage you to actively make connections to the life sciences co community. Uh, trust me, they need to be talking with you in terms of trying to get smarter on rockets and, and these kinds of things. But you also need to be talking to them because they have a perspective that, at least from what I've seen in, in knowing people for 20 years and coming to conferences like this, they have perspectives that you don't have. Both are essential. Both are, are necessary. You know, one last question is, um, my image of what space was going to be like came from the 1951 series, Chesley Bonestell and the boys did. And they had the rotating space station that you later saw in 2001. That's the only form of artificial gravity I've ever been exposed to. The idea is now 55 years old. Um, is it a feasible? Is rotation enough to produce an artificial gravity? Yes. Good. <laughs> we should start doing it. And there are other things related to propulsion as well. I mean, you know, you, when you talk about atomic drives and all this, I mean, you can create artificial gravity by constant acceleration. That's if, a if very good going, point. If you're going fast enough. Right. And then you can turn around and do it, put it in reverse mode, and your gravity vector stays the, uh, the, the, the same. But that's like, that's like nuclear fusion. That's a long way away. And so... You know, we need to be, I think, a little more concerned with the intermediate term. Than well, the other thing that astonishes me here is the amount of information. Everything that you've said has come as a surprise to me. It's been amazing to listen to what you've had to say. And it disturbs me to realize that there is no regular place, even when I look at uh, Science Week or when I look at uh, The New Scientist, the various sources from which I, with which I try to keep up on the latest science day by day by day. These questions do not appear. In fact, many, many people here um, have had very important things to say that they should have been saying to each other for a long time and should have been saying to people like me for a long time. There's a press apparatus and there's a news gathering apparatus that exists within this community, but the trick, I think, is going to be to gather that news apparatus, which is sitting in part in front of me, directly in front of me, from what I understand, um, and figure out how to get press releases out on a daily daily basis about these, the, not just the answers, but the questions. Yeah, you see, part of the problem when it comes to life science and, and engineering is a culture problem. And I see this all the time at, at, at NASA. To, to an, engineers live in a Newtonian universe. And it's good that they, that they do. To an engineer, the light switch is either on or it's off. And there's just not much gray area there. In the life sciences, there are only two absolutes, life and death. Everything else zone. And so there is a culture clash because to the, to the hard-nosed engineers, life science really isn't a science because it's fuzzy. And, and, to and, those of and us, uh, by to their training, they, they, they tend to kind of hold it at, at, at bay. Amazing. Yeah. Rich? And addressing that, I'd like to say um, at a uh, lecture by Stephen Hawking at um, Caltech, his associates described his approach to a problem as different than many of his colleagues that he didn't approach it with the math. He approached it through the hypothesis and then found the math to, to prove or disprove it. And That's that right. might be the way to mediate the fuzzy area. Uh, it's just like in the creative fields. Um, it would be the same uh, with science. There are aspects that are not fuzzy, although empirically, if you can repeat the experiment, it's not fuzzy. Um, and, and to clearly know which is which, exercise for an engineer, for one who thinks primarily in that which is vital, and, uh, and, they t and it's not so much a clash as the technology needs to exist on how to mediate the two processes and recognize which is math and which is the speculative hypothesis to which you want to go, to which you can imagine for the solution that doesn't yet exist. Um, and not let the math keep you from going there, because traveling with math is like walking with monkey bars with monkey bars. You don't let go of one, you don't grab another until, you know, you don't let go until you have another firmly in your hand. But there are small quantum leaps in thinking that need to take place creatively without forfeiting the math or disrespecting it or, obviously, um, that, that can be integrated. And, and I, I enjoyed your comment very much. Uh, and it's very exciting to think the synergy that's going to happen from this discussion with the wonderful information that you've contributed all.
also a political dimension too. One, one final, one, yeah. there's also a political dimension to this and, and that should not, I mean, everybody should be uh, uh, aware of that. In my mind, I've always played out this scenario as if I controlled NASA and if I could design a variable G research facility at which the first gravity level was one third G. Let me ask you something, let's take a poll. How many people think the Mars Society would support that kind of research? Yeah. Okay, how many? They would not support that kind of research. Yeah. Right. My hypothesis, they would not support that kind of research. Why? Because the answer could invalidate the dream. And a lot of times in the life sciences, the engineers, do, the engineers follow the rule of don't ask the question unless you really want to know the answer. No, no, no kidding here. So now, now I'm, I'm glad that most of you think the Mars support that, and I know some of you are very active in that organization, do me a favor, start asking your fellow buddies about whether they would support that or not, and the litmus test is, I want to see them support that in public. Okay. That, there Rich, was one, one there last was comment. One uh, comment you made about um, being able to produce artificial gravity with acceleration constant I'm acceleration. Sorry, I can't hear you. You said you were able to produce constant acceleration produced artificial yes. gravity. One of my authors, who I'm very well acquainted with now, was one of the guys who first started uh, training the astronauts, the Mercury astronauts, back in the early 60s. And he ran the big um, centrifuge in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And they were running guys at two Gs for 24 hours. And I said, why the devil would you do that? And he said, because in those days, we were talking about putting huge fission reactors in space, accelerating at a G for a week, and being at Mars within two weeks. And they said, we could do that. It's just a question of how, much, how badly you want to do it. Yeah. I mean. Given the right technology, you can you can uh, uh, expose fighter pilots to 25 Gs Actually, for short periods of time. So it's uh, the human physiology is amazingly uh, flexible with the right technology. I'd like to speak very briefly to you're saying that the the fear of the answer invalidating the dream. Um, here, the reaction has been welcoming mm -hmm. um, the facts to address them and find the solution, which I think is the proper attitude to take. It's just finding the way. I mean you get stuck in the known, in the comfort zone, in where the answers are. Well, you become stuck in the myth. Yeah. And the myth needs to be, there's nothing wrong yeah. with a myth, no. but eventually it needs to be evidence driven. And it's symbiotic. The, 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 the process is symbiotic. So don't let the answer uh, cease you. And Laura, you had something to say. Go ahead, Laura. I did, just very quickly. I just, um, this goes back to yesterday, uh, yesterday's panel about the media and getting the public excited. Um, I just have two brief little uh, words First, uh, from journalism, know your audience, know who you're talking to. Um, if they're not interested in space, you have to let them imagine themselves in space. Like uh, this book that I'm working, that I've worked on. Imagine yourself in space, you know, with your significant other, etc. You have to. That's the way to capture the public's imagination, is to have them see exactly how it relates to their life or their child's life, their family's life, their friends. So know your audience and make them imagine the possibilities. That's my comments. Um, it's really interesting to me. I, I, you know, I was, used to work for Dr. O'Neill, and um, there used to be a conference where all these kind of things were talked about, the Space Studies Institute conferences in Princeton, which were what I consider renaissance events. And um, we've been through a, 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 we're going through a cycle, and I think we're coming out another part of the cycle. And what, what happened was, up until the first shuttle flew in 82, everybody thought transportation was handled because the myth was it was going to fly 50 times a year. The High Frontier book was predicated on that, and all these dreams were predicated on that. So everybody focused on the destination. At that time, people were spewing out images of colonies. You would go to SSI conferences, and there would be biomedical studies. There would be people talking about the sociology or how you would create city councils and space habitats, all these kind of things. And then as the, the, the myth began to be get shattered, what happened was our movement, and, and I guess it's, a, it's an adaptive it way of dealing with things, process. has now our movement, our part of the movement, which is let's go do it and get it done, has shifted into how do we create our own transportation systems to get there. So that we have the dominance at our conference of transportation on Friday, that intense day that you know, kind of anchors the whole event, is all about how to get there. And so this has been a bit of an experiment to introduce, I, I guess we kind of introducing life science 
in the sexiest part of it, you know, to get it in here. <laughs> Good morning. Um, well, yeah, if we, okay, yeah, we planned it. And there's a reason sex is pleasurable, it's so that we will continue. There you go, there you go, you'll do it more. Yeah, I was, I was talking to Howard about that earlier, actually. That only the higher species, uh, uh, the higher primates and dolphins enjoy sex, and then the tool makers, which are the ones that have the capability to get us off the planet, being human beings, enjoy sex even, you know, more. So we, anyway, um, what I wanted to say is that um, I think that I would urge y'all, if you enjoyed this session, um, as an evolutionary thing, that you contact the leadership of the foundation, you talk to Jeff Krukin, um, you talk to any of the board members, Bill Boland, I think there's maybe the only other board member here. Um, let them know that you want to see this kind of thing expanded upon. I've had three or four people come up to me during this session saying, we need to expand on the life sciences at our events here. And, and I think, uh, Jim, your point, great line, my friend. I think you're really getting it there. Um, I, I would love to see sessions on that. How big a colony to build? How do you need to rotate? What happens inside the bio? All of that stuff. So please lobby for this and, and let people know you want to see more of this. Um, this has been an excellent session. Um, I think we have made tentatively one decision that we probably are not going to be doing Sunday mornings anymore, <laughs> especially in Vegas. But um, that, that's not a board decision. It's just somebody, some of the, uh, the people running the conference have said that. Um, I do want to thank you all an amazing session. It was very eye-opening. Um, I love the combination of, of the, the science and the spirituality and all of this put together and the humanity of it all. So I just want to acknowledge our panel and, and say thank you very much. Thank you. You all can just sit here for just a second. Um, Chuck Lauer has a, uh, a brief announcement regarding the space fashion show. So since we're in the humanistic sure. side of things, uh, Chuck, come on up. This is the uh, first time we've ever actually done the vote. I don't know how many of the people are here, but uh, we actually had a tie. Uh, it was a fa fairly uh, big. There were most people actually voted for either of the two of these. Uh, the, the loser was also fairly clear. Why don't you flash that one up? Uh, uh, so that, <laughs> that, that one was fairly clear, too. Uh, so the, uh, everybody that voted for the winner gets a uh, rocket plane laser pen. So uh, Mike. Uh, Alan Boyle, um, some uh, mystery person that didn't put their name on, but they voted for nine for first and seven for least. So whoever that is, if they're here, come up. Uh, Derek Shannon, Layla Stenberg, and somebody did actually did use the secret identity code. So whoever VP40 is, uh, come, uh, uh, come on over here and uh, uh, get your prizes. Thank you. Really appreciate everybody doing it. Yeah, I mean, we've we got to move back to a little bit more of the Renaissance stuff. It's just too much fun, these kind of things. A um, couple of quick announcements. Uh, there are extra SpaceX t-shirts out there, so uh, go grab them. Um, spread the word by, you know, emblazoning people with the uh, logos on their chest and get them out there. I want to wrap up real quickly by saying, folks, we have... Uh, I'm always honored to come to these conferences. I tell people this is a players' conference. It's not... Um, Go to the ISDC, which is a different kind of conference, which is a lot of people coming together from a lot of uh, areas and this and that and the other, and a lot of people just coming to hear things. We're a smaller conference, um, and what, what I see when I look around the room are people who are either in space companies, in space research, in space sciences, involved in space companies, about to have a space company, maybe just lost a space company, uh, people that are actually doing the work, writing the books, reporting on it, things like that. It is definitely conference of doers, and I am always honored to be at this event uh, and to be lucky enough to be a part of it and work with the people who have done it. I want to definitely thank uh, Jeff and Krista and um, um, Mr. Green, who have done an amazing amount of work. The hotel has been fantastic to us. Uh, please, again, give feedback to the board members that are here, to Jeff Krukin, uh, to some of our more vocal people internally, like Ben Muniz, who was speaking over there them, tell these people what you think of this event. Whether you want to see more of this, less of that, uh, whether you like the location we're at, the dates, the times, there's going to be a lot of discussion. We're an experiment in progress. And um, it, it's really exciting. I think that it's very important to understand that in this room there's a dream. There's a dream in here, in our hearts, there's a dream in this room that we all hold. And that is a dream of an incredible future out there, an incredible future for humanity.
future that we can all participate in, that we can all go out into, that we can go out into that canvas of the stars and paint that future individually the way we want it to be. And that's the dream we hold inside. And there's a dream outside of this room. And it's, it, it's almost a subconscious dream, and that's that those people out there want this too. They don't know they want it yet. It's because they don't know what they don't know. But they want that kind of future. They don't want to be turning it on the, the TV and watching you know, Israel and Hezbollah kick the shit out of each other. You know, they, those kind of things will continue to happen, sure, but they, which, by the way, largely boils down to um, intolerance of each other and land disputes. And you know, one of the great things about space was we had a uh, session in, in the Space Studies Institute um, one, one evening on, on space colonies. And, and the idea came up and, and, uh, was that, you know, look, if I, well, I, I was talking and I, was, I said, you know what, if, if you don't like, I'm going to build my space colony, okay? And if you don't like peas or carrots, go build your own damn space colony, <laughs> you know? Or if you like peas or carrots, because I hate peas or carrots. And only people who hate peas and carrots will be in my space colony. So we'll have the pro-peas space colony and the pro-carrot space colony. And the, you know, you can have the Hezbollah space colony and this and that and the other. And the point is that we have to let people know that that future, that horizon out there is wide, not the narrow thing they see in front of them now. If you go with the, the psychology we have today, the horizon narrow. If you go into space, horizon opens wide up and all things become possible. Everything gets reversed. So take that message out there, tell people about it, be excited, talk to the reporters, not just the space reporters, call up your local press and talk to them. Get them excited about it because they get it, they understand it. They just don't know it's available to them. Thank you for coming.